So the resonate with customers, this is getting to you here, right? Um, this is kind of my version of synthesizing, you know, Steve Blank and a lot of other stuff, right? Um, but what I see is discovery, validation, strategy, team and process, efficiency, and scaling. Yeah? Um, there was a paper uh, written by Startup Compass, which is now just called Compass, um, that goes through and demonstrates that 74% of all companies fail. The ones that don't fail because of founder breakup fail because of what they call inconsistent practices. And what they mean by that is they get their priorities out of order. So they do a mass marketing campaign before they validated that people want the product. They hire a head of sales before the founder has clarified the process, a repeatable process for selling, right? Etc. cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, so um, you have to go through a lot of divergent thinking and activities here, and then you move towards convergent action. Um, and then in general, you know, I think customer development has to come before product development, which has to come before market development. This is if you are trying to de-risk your startup. And again, a lot of these activities are about de-risking. So if you've built an MVP and you have 10,000 users coming to your app every single day, you can probably skip a lot of this early stuff. I don't think you should because I actually think once you start hiring people, the, the knowledge that you get from here, you can actually share with people that are joining your team, right? So a lot, of a lot of companies get a lot of headaches because the founders learn things from customers in the market and they hire two more people and those two people, it turns out, have no idea what the founder knows, right? Anyway. So as I was stating earlier, many entrepreneurs go out and execute before they do discovery, right? And so uh, the act of discovery or the, the set of things you do during the discovery phase is trying to get you to see the, uh, the world through the eyes of the customer rather than through the eyes of the entrepreneur or the company, right? Um, so it starts with customer development. So you guys have been doing this for five weeks, right? So I can probably skip through all this, right? Skip through. Have you had 30 plus conversations with potential customers? Did you guys record those conversations and transcribe them? Did anybody record every conversation and transcribe it? No? They're all over email? Okay. Um, did, you get it, did you get your conversations on video by chance? No. Okay. So the, uh, I have a practice that I am trying to write about in my book, which I call artifact-driven customer development. So one of the things that happens in customer development is you get all this knowledge, and then you take away from it basically whatever you want to take away from it at the time. One of the things about the human mind is we tend to be looking for what's called confirmatory. We have a confirmatory bias. We, we are looking for things that confirm our existing thinking, right? Uh, and so you talk to 30 people and then you run away and be like, I was right, <laughs> you know? Uh, and then you tell your product uh, and engineering teams, I was right, build this. And then they go, you know, okay, dictator, like why? Why am I building this? Because I heard from 30 customers, this is what we have to build, right? Um, and the process of um, developing artifacts, right? As in recording the conversations, creating videos, transcribing things, um, acting like a social scientist and encoding your interviews, right? Um, all help create a data set, which then you can share with investors, with prospective team members, with your own team, and then when you're gonna fight about whether or not you should build this feature first or that feature first, you actually have information that you can share with people, as opposed to, so instead of fighting about it, you just, you just show them the data, right? Um, have you created personas from your customer development? 
How many of you guys have personas? One, two, three, four. OK. Um, personas become very, very helpful when, once you have a team. Um, investors also look for personas, but they really only want to see your beachhead persona, right? They want to see who's the one person you're building this for now, right? But in order to choose the correct persona, it helps to build many personas, right? And as you move forward with your team, uh, having personas helps to make important decisions, right? Um, one of the things that people forget when they're developing personas, uh, something that I think about a lot is, are they, uh, do you guys know about the adoption curve, red crossing the chasm, all that? Okay, so are these guys innovators, early adopters, or majority or laggards, right? Because even though there might be an extremely attractive customer, or persona, an attractive per a customer persona because they're willing to pay a lot, or they have really big problems, right? Or sometimes, you know, you have a connection through a friend and the next thing you know, you're meeting with like, a decision maker at a really huge company and they say, this is what I need and you run away going, this is what we need to do, right? But if they're not early on the adoption curve, they're not gonna adopt your product, right? Or if you build for personas that are innovators, they will leave you by the time you ever get any traction because innovators, that's how they do, right? They use the next cool app, they try it out for a while, they tell everybody about it and then they're on to the next big thing, right? And so. Sequencing personas is extremely helpful. Um, and then in terms of delighting customers, you know about this like Kano model of product development, product design and development, Kano model? Basically, musts, wants, and wows. Um, in order to wow somebody, you have to meet needs that they didn't even know they had. In order to satisfy them, you have to meet the needs that they're able to tell you about. And then there are a bunch of musts that they're not even tell, telling you about because they're taking them for granted because other things already solve them, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So a lot of people, when they come out with uh, their original product, they're satisfying wants or, or they're, they're satisfying wants, but they never found any wows and they don't they forgot a lot of the musts. So they, they're not finding product market fit. If you have your musts, wants, and wows. Uh, you should have product market fit. Um, so this is the market beachhead uh, kind of planning exercise worksheet thing. So if we had the workbook, this would be in it. Um, so what I would want you to do is prioritize your personas. So if you have eight personas, I want to know who's, who's first, who's your market beachhead, then who's next, who are the adjacent possible, uh, and then who's much later, and then who would be out of the market Right? If you can't tell me who's out of the market, I think that you're a delusional entrepreneur. Right? You have to tell me, here's a persona I found, and here's why they're never going to be my customer. Because it's just not going to work for whatever reason. So there's out of play too demanding, as in you met, you met a big decision maker at Oracle, and they want your like, you know, whatever, next generation SaaS software. And the reality is, is they're probably too demanding. You can get that customer, and no matter how much they pay you, they, they occupy all your time, and they're never satisfied, and they leave you anyway. Uh, and then there's also customers that are unaddressable, that for whatever reason, they're just like, either they can't access your product, or you can't get it to them in any kind of meaningful way or price point. And all companies start at the margins of, this is the disruptive theory, right? Dis disruptive innovation. You have to start by people that are unserved by the existing market, and then you move your way into the, the mass market, middle market. The other strategy is like a Tesla, right? Tesla is not bringing cars to people that don't have transportation. Tesla is serving what are called extreme users, right? Extreme users are dissatisfied. They know why they're dissatisfied. They can tell you why they're dissatisfied, and they're willing to pay you more if you can satisfy them. Right? And you have to start on those ends and then work your way towards the middle. It's very rare that companies just start out in the middle. And when they do, um, it's kind of a crapshoot as to whether or not it works. Right? So um, differentiating your product uh, or service, right? Uh, or, or company, sorry. Um, most founders come in and they show me this little matrix where they're really good and everyone else sucks. Um, I think that that's like, 
not very information driven. Um, I want to see a differentiated product, a differentiated target customers and beachhead markets, differentiated customer acquisition channels, differentiated path to market. So for me, a differentiated company isn't good enough. I need like, like an onion, layers of differentiation. Um, and this blue ocean versus red ocean strategy is a good way to um, go through this exercise. So what are you going to eliminate? What are you going to reduce? What are you going to raise? What are you going to create? Anyway, so this is kind of what you end up with. So this is Minerva out on a strategy canvas against Harvard. <laughs>